Hello everyone, we are going to be talking about asthma, COPD, and allergies today, or allergy medications. Um, first off though, I do want to make a note of something that I think will help you guys tremendously, specifically with asthma, um, keeping your, your treatments straight and everything, because in this lecture I am going to talk some about first line, second line, etc. There will be a separate presentation I'm going to record um, that is going to be the asthma um, guidelines, which is right here, I have it pulled up, asthma, COPD, pharmacotherapy, it's a really quick one jam-packed with a ton of information. So don't be, de be deceived that there's only seven slides. There's a ton of stuff on there, tons of test questions, guaranteed. Um, so please make sure you look at that and don't skip it. Student some students in the past have skipped some of these things that I post. And again, I try to just only post things that are gonna be relevant for you guys. But um, so there's, there's these two lectures for asthma, two PowerPoint rather, presentations I'm going to be posting for asthma. Um, the big one here um, with asthma, COPD, and allergies, and the small one, asthma, COPD. Um, so definitely look for those on Blackboard. The other thing I wanted to pull your attention to, and I will put this on Blackboard, is the asthma quick care reference, diagnosing and managing asthma. I think this will help you tremendously when you study for pharmacology, but I think it'll also help with maybe pathophys, maybe not, but I think it also help with ICM. Um, so it's a really nice it's oh, I'm, I'm gonna say only 12 pages i know that's there's a lot of information here and seems like a lot but um it's to me a nice kind of condensed small easy package um and i like it a lot my wife likes it a lot um, she uses it in the clinic and i i like to refer to it and definitely when teaching you guys um so go ahead and scroll through the whole thing i'm not gonna read the whole thing to you guys but go ahead and i mean definitely look at it this is from the uh nih um so it's credible source. Um, and like I said, I think this is really good stuff for you guys to look at. Specifically though, and I wanna scroll down here to where it talks about the stepwise approach. So um, this is the initial visit classifying, um, which is gonna be good and can help you again with test questions for pharmacology. So you know how severe is their asthma, right? And then that'll correspond to a step, which the steps are um, basically what you prescribe and how you treat your patient. Um, and, and what you prescribe is what I'm highlighting. I mean, there's other things here you do. There's other management things. So, I mean, please, uh, you guys have to, you know, worry about the whole patient. I only have to worry about the drugs now. I'm kidding. But, um, you know, I'm more focused on the drugs and definitely for this class, but it'll show you, um, and this is the, the follow-up visits, but then here's the step, stepwise approach. So you step up and down. It is important to step down if possible, um, which sometimes people forget, but You'll notice here it starts talking about some of the drugs. We have the SABAs here, which are short-acting um, medications, and the LABAs, which I'll, I'll go through all the definitions here in a little bit, so don't don't stress too much about that. But I think it'd be good. I'm not going to be able to do this um, while I'm giving the presentation, but I think it would be good while I'm going through this lecture with you guys now, which I'm going to jump to here in a second. I think it would be good to have these this um, stepwise treatment kind of close by or maybe on another device or printed out or whatever, um, just so you can kind of refer to it and kind of make notes of where these things fall into place. So um, again, it may be overwhelming to do, but I think it's, it's worth maybe at least browsing through this and looking through it before you start the, the rest of the lecture, just so you get a general idea of kind of where these doses, I'm sorry, where, where these drugs fit. Um, so you know that, and then to the abbreviations are all here. They're all spelled out. So um, ICS, what is that? Inhaled corticosteroid, um, LABA, LABA, inhaled long acting beta agonist, um, which are drugs we'll be seeing, leukotriene receptor antagonist, right? Um, and so those, these are drugs we're going to be talking about here in a minute. And it, I think it'll be beneficial. And also, I think it'll hopefully make studying for ICM maybe easier um, in that you can, you know, you can kind of go back to this chart and, um, and see where these drugs fit. Because it's, you know, I'm going to be mentioning first line, second line, third line, alternative drugs. I'm going to be talking about, uh, or adjunct drugs, rather, not alternative. Um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time. You'll notice here it's broken down by age. I mainly am going to be referring to the adult population. So for um, for this population, it's going to be greater than 12 years of age. It's going to be considered the adult. Um, and then, But you do notice that they will have 5 to 11 and 0 through 4. For testing purposes, you guys don't need to, for my exam, you don't have to stress too much about knowing the exact of the different ages, but definitely I think it's relevant for ICM. I mean, I would check with the ICM professors, but in the past, I know that they have tested you guys on the different ages and how you treat them. Um, I, I'm not 
making any predictions. I don't know what they're going to be doing this year, but um, but this again, this chart helps you if if you do need are required to study that. I think this is nice and it's helped students in the past because it's if they're talking about a pediatric patient. Um, you can go here and and look at that. Um, and then it also too it has some comparative daily dosages, um, which again you won't be tested over dosages for me, but this will definitely help you on your rotations. Um, and again, I think it helps you give give you a, a good idea of of how to prescribe these medications. More dosages here. Um, note note those, or just again look through those. It has some typical dosages, which again I, I think are good. Um, don't worry about necessarily memorizing these for my test, but. Um, but definitely, I think this is worth holding on to and something that could be beneficial in the future. And the rest is just, you know, more patient information, etc. Additional resources if you did want to dig deeper. So while we're here today is for this presentation. So let's go ahead and get into this. First, just background. You guys are probably already used to this from me by now. Um, stuff I don't necessarily, you know, stress out as far as testing purposes just to kind of make sure everyone's on the same page definitely stuff you should be seeing in in farm in um, pathophys and icm um, but just read through these it's not um not anything really big um this is interesting don't stress too much about this other than we have seen some of these things maybe in other uh, modules and or we will see them in other modules so you notice the first one on top there beta blockers right so we talked in the cardiology module about how beta blockers can actually exacerbate or make these breathing disorders such as asthma or COPD worse um, and so note that aspirin's another one there and I mean definitely read through all of them I'm just noting the the drugs pharmacological stimuli is a generic kind of one so there are instances where I will highlight for adverse effects or contraindications or whatever um, so this is just more of an FYI table. Don't don't stress about memorizing it. But I mean, it may may be beneficial to help with ICM or, or pathophys. I'm, I'm not sure. This one is a visualization here of where some of the drugs are working and some of the um, uh, really pathophysiology. So um, don't other than it's related to its mechanism of action. Definitely, you know, as always, I want you guys to know mechanism of actions. But um, don't stress too much about knowing this this cascade or this pathway. Um, you may need to know it for pathophysiology, so definitely refer to them. But um, for my course, this is just here. Just to, you can, I mean, again, visualization. I, I like some of these things because it helps me for mechanism of action. Because um, I, I, I guess I am more visual, whatever. I can kind of picture these things, and I'm like, oh, and I just, I, I will visually put an X somewhere or something, and it's like, oh, this is where it's blocking this. Or we're going to talk about um, antihistamines in this lecture. So where are, where's histamine involved, right? And what's the effect of that? Again, just read through this, just some symptoms, um, just FYI for my course. Um, again, definition, just general, read through it. Um, just make sure everyone kind of has a, a basic general definition of COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Anti-inflammatory agents. So we're going to go through these here. Um, we are, just a note here with the corticosteroids, we are gonna, we're gonna touch upon them. Um, and but we will be going more in depth with these medications, specifically the systemic corticosteroids. We will be having um, a more in depth lecture on those in the endocrine module. So stay tuned for that. Um, and so just I know some people have different backgrounds and everything, but so I've had students in the past that have maybe more of a health care background. They get this lecture and they're like, there's way more going on with prednisone. Why did you you know? So again, this is kind of a focused for the pulmonary module, systemic corticosteroids, sort of their niche use with that, but just know that you will see these corticosteroids um, coming up later on, So, and, and then more in depth. Uh, but for testing purposes for this module, just focus on what is in my presentation, what I'm saying, and then my slides and tables, right? Asthma pharmacotherapy, this is okay. I'm, read through it. Don't stress about memorizing this. Um, definitely, I refer to, I'm going to do a separate lecture on asthma pharmacotherapy. Um, so definitely go go to that lecture. That one is more up to date than this table is. But you can kind of look through it and it, it gives you kind of a general idea. Um, definitely note here that the long acting beta 2 receptor agonist um, on that asthma quick care reference guide from NIH, they do refer to those as LABA, L-A-B-A, -A, so it's long-acting beta 2 receptor agonist. So I do sometimes refer to them as LABAs. And then SABA, short-acting beta 2 receptor agonist. Um, and I think I said agonist here too, so, so it's agonist, it's an agonist, it's not an antagonist. Um, so they're 
those um, are also referred to as Saba, S-A-B-A. -A. So um, Saba and Laba. So I will refer to those. I, I, I say those at whatever. And, and just so, so note, note that. Um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page of the terminology. And then the Sabbath thing reminds me of Shaba, Shaba Ranks. Any Shaba Ranks fans? <laughs> Mr. Lover Man. I don't know if you guys remember that song, but, um, and then there was also another, there was a rap song in 2013, um, that by the Aesop mob that I had pharmacy students at that time and they would always say, uh, they would sing that song to me. But anyway, so, <laughs> so I always think of Shaba Ranks and, uh, like two gold chains, like I'm Sha Shaba Ranks. But Saba, so it's Saba, not Shaba. Um, anyways, that's just what those students got stuck in my head, and forever I'll remember them, and I will always refer, <laughs> think of Shaba ranks when I think of albuterol, which is a <laughs> ubiquitous drug. It's prescribed. If we fill it all the time in the pharmacy or whatever. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks guys for having that memory. Good times, right? Um, anyway, so yeah, just make sure you're on the same same page there as far as. Um, as far as abbreviations are current, and again, please do not memorize this and don't necessarily um, stick to this as far as uh, the pharmacotherapy. Corticosteroids, okay, mechanism of action. Take home point, these are anti-inflammatory medications. They inhibit the inflammation response. So you remember in the first module this year, we talked a lot, or in pathophysiology, you talked a lot about the inflammatory cascades, inflammatory response. So, and we we touched a little bit about that on the corticosteroids. I don't know if you guys remember that far back, but <laughs> it was mentioned. But um, but anyways, and so um, definitely read through this. Uh, the take home point is that they 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 blunt or they stop the inflammation cascade or inflammation process. Lots of things are involved, so look at all those things. Um, but because they are um, they are anti-inflammatory, they help prevent bronchoconstriction, which is good and kind of a, a you know advantageous when you are talking about an airway airway restriction, right? So something like asthma, COPD, and then they also help produce smooth muscle relaxation, which there's smooth muscles in the lungs, and so again that aids in breathing. So that's the take on point as far as why they are. Uh, beneficial. Unfortunately, I can't, and this is phospholipase A, and this usually they write this with a little two. My little two became a big two. I don't, it's all grown up. Oh my God. They grew up so fast. No, I'm kidding. Um, the A, the little two became a big two. Just so if you want to correct that, you maybe see it in text and stuff as a little two. Um, but unfortunately, you just have to do, kind of read through this. Know that it, it involves uh, phospholipase A2. Know that it involves the uh, COX2. Um, and then it also involves some things like interleukins, interferon. Um, so again, it's 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 a it's a big. I and mean, again, you guys remember from the first module. There's it's a big response with inflammation. And so these these basically blunt that, or they they say stop that. Here's some examples of some of the inhaled ones, and then systemic. We'll talk about here in a little bit. But um, so they do they do make these as in, inhalers or as in, in, inhaled products. Mechanism of action again. It's just you know kind of a a, a summary of, of what specific things are they they doing. So they're decreasing all of these granulocytes, lymphocytes, monocytes, right? So again, take home point. Basically, what's happening? They are re helping reduce the bronchoconstriction, helping relax smooth muscles, and ha helping to hopefully increase or help the person breathe. Um, the other thing to note too with mechanism action, um, and you'll see this with this what, on that asthma quick care with prescribing, and and then also with the the guidelines as far as their step therapies, um, because their mechanism action is trying to blunt this big cascade. So I mean, you know, in, inflammation process is this big coordinated process, right? You guys can remember that it's, it's a whole bunch of little things that are go going on. So it's it's like trying to stop a um, a semi truck that's fully loaded. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever driven a big truck or any 18 wheeler drivers. In the, um, but you so, say, or if you had like dr driven like a U-Haul truck or something. So anytime you have like a big truck with a lot of stuff, a lot of weight on the back, you can't stop as quickly as you can in a small car, let's say that's not really loaded up. So um, that's the way I like to think of it because I've driven big trucks, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, you, you know, it's that you can't really um, hit the brake, so to speak, and stop the inflammation from like one second to the next. Um, it, and so these aren't, and the whole reason I'm going on this rant about driving big trucks is because um, these are not what you can, what they call a rescue um, form or a short act. You know, these aren't something that you can use acutely to, if someone's, you know, having trouble breathing, you don't give them this uh, inhaled corticosteroid and then, you know, step back and be like, oh, it's going to, because it's, 
the, the process, because of the mechanism of action and because of its effect, it, it takes a while to have its desired effect as far as helping um, with bronchoconstriction, etc. Um, so these are not considered rescue medications like the Sabazar, which the, the short acting uh, beta agonist, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But um, just want to make, make a note on that because I think that's a good connection or f- rather for me, it helps me remember the mechanism of action, but then it also helps me remember um, or rationalize why it wouldn't be, um, and I'm not going to say first line, but I'm going to say rescue. So these are sometimes first line in the sense that they are prescribed early on or as in, in again, in step two, a lot of times in those, you'll notice those, um, those in, inhaled corticosteroids, which I believe were abbreviated ICS on the on your if you're following along at home with your asthma quick care guide, um, so you know that's that's something I think that will help hopefully help you connect the dots as far as mechanism of action use and then kind of where it's used for the asthma patient. So with its uses, um, mild or moderate asthma or COPD, um, and this is why I noted this. It says first line maintenance therapy. So in the in the past, students have gotten confused and they, they, they see first line and they think rescue or inhalation. And there's sometimes these, these board type questions that are kind of tricky about what do you prescribe first? But so if a person is having acute exacerbation, the meaning, and this will, this will be hopefully reinforced with you guys in ICM, but if they're just, if they're acutely having problems breathing, um, you, you, these are first line, but it's not something that will rescue the person and actually immediately or kind of quickly improve their breathing situation this is be- again because it's it's putting the brakes on this big truck because you're trying to you're trying to stop this inflammation cascade right um you have to you have to um basically take these their first line right but their first line and they're kind of their maintenance therapy is what the language that they'll use it's it's so um and the guidelines so when i say they i mean the guidelines and experts and stuff um no global cons- you know the third world or no i'm kidding um the illuminati when they say no i'm kidding um but yeah so it's the first line for maintenance okay so again students have had problems in the past uh, again, always as usual, email me if what I just said is confusing. You're like, why do you keep talking about trucks? Um, but yeah, uh, and hopefully it'll it'll come clear too once you um, once we go through the, the pharmacotherapy lecture too and kind of go through the guidelines more specifically. But just just note that and remember that for when we do look at the guidelines. Okay, so um, they are used, like I said, more for maintenance, um, and it does help. It can help with very, very severe obstruction. Um, and they can be used to um, PO or by mouth or IV. So that's usually not maintenance, but that will be like if you're in an inpatient situation, um, they may go ahead and do some IV steroids or, and by the way too, for, for uh, terminology purposes, so corticosteroids or glucocorticosteroids and then steroids, those are all AKAs, all, um, you know, also known as, um, they're synonyms and they can be used interchangeably. But so, so the systemic steroids, are required. They're typically, and then the oral are typically, you'll see this in the guidelines too. It'll be um, early on and it'll just be, it's kind of to kickstart the inhaled corticosteroids, so to speak. Like it'll be um, acutely, they'll do a short burst, they'll call it, or a short cur- course of, let's say, prednisone. They'll do prednisone for like five days. Um, and that'll be, that's a systemic steroid, right? And so that'll be something that they'll do. And then they'll prescribe them their rescue inhaler, which is albuterol, let's say, and then a long acting. Um, or rather inhaled corticosteroid for, for more maintenance. And I was going to say long, the labas too, but that's don't want to get confused here. And then too, for both asthma and COPD, you will see these being prescribed in combination. They make some combination products as well, um, but they may be um, prescribed either they, they come in combination or they're prescribed in combination with a laba. So salmeterol is an example of one of those that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Emergency treatment. So um, I mentioned too that they can be used inpatient. Um, this lecture 22, just ignore that. That's it. We're going to talk about the endocrine module. So actually, you know what I'll do? There's some movie magic. I just edited live. Um, so you will be seeing these talked more about in the endocrine module. Um, as far as emergency treatment goes, I do have some specific slides. So in that other PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to be pr- providing you guys on asthma and COPD. I'm going to give you the emergency treatment um, guidelines from up to date. And definitely I want you guys to put a star by those when I give them to you because I'm definitely going to pull test questions from there. And there's a specific section in there that talks about best practices now and kind of the most current recommendations for the emergency treatment of asthma and COPD. So stay tuned for that. You'll be seeing that later. 
adverse effects. Um, unfortunately, there are some adverse effects you have to worry about. The hoarseness is one, and it's funny I say it, and then like my voice, I'm like, ah, thirsty. Um, but anyways, hoarseness is one, um, and that's something that people complain about. Um, thrush is another one, so candidiasis, a, a fungal infection, is one that can happen. And this is why um, they recommend that um, your patients, and most pharmacists will, will be telling your patients this, so you don't have to stress too much about it. But um, something to remember is that, or I mean, you can tell your patients this too, <laughs> well, I won't get mad at you, um, is that they typically recommend that you rinse your mouth out with water after using these um, steroids just to kind of help make sure there's not the residual one because the, um, the steroid use can call it, can unfortunately sometimes cause or lead to an overgrowth of a fungal infection. Um, again, because of that, the, it's a messing with the immune response, right? So it kind of can throw things off balance. So unfortunately, can lead to an overgrowth of a fungus, right? Uh, systemic effects. The good news is you don't have to worry about them too much when you have when you are only doing the inhaled preparations. But like I said, sometimes with asthma, COPD, you will have to give maybe systemic um, steroids or the PO, right? Or, P, or IV PO, right? Um, so that is something that you want to look at and definitely pay attention here and and note that, you know, if you're giving, if there's a case question or whatever that talks about giving a patient PO prednisone, um, definitely you, you want to um, think about that and look at this. And you'll notice too, they, they mentioned that, you, you know, you can't do abrupt cessation of therapy. So this is why you'll have a steroid taper. So um, again, it's going to depend on the, on the age of the person, the dose you're giving and the duration you're giving it. So for example, sometimes, um, you know, I'll, I'll see where with pediatricians, they'll give prednisone for three days, maybe five days, and again on a lower dose, you don't necessarily, or for an adult too, um, you don't necessarily need to worry about tapering that off. But if you are giving a bigger dose, um, or and, and or if you again depends on the severity or the patient. I mean, there's a lot of nuances there that I hopefully you guys will will be elucidated in um, ICM. Um, but there, there's instances where you do prescribe bigger doses of steroids and for longer t longer terms. Or longer time, um, and so that's where they make uh, you've maybe had familiar with, or you've seen friends or families or yourselves taking the. Uh, they have like the medrol dose packs, um, where it's it's you start out with you know seven tablets the first day, and then you take one less each day, and so basically you have to taper off because of this potential for adrenal insufficiency. Um, so because yeah, so it's just basically that these um, these medications can cause all of these um, adverse effects. And um, anyways, that's that's the point of, of this, that they, they should be tapered off. Um, and I'm kind of hesitating a little bit because I'm trying to remember what we're going to say. And, and you'll get this again in the endocrine module. But um, take on point here is that, you know, the systemic effects, you just have to be worried about it. So it'll be uh, the case question will be if they're given oral or they're given IV steroids. But for inhaled, definitely worry more about the thrush and then hoarseness um, and that adverse effect. All right, changing gears here a little bit. We have the mass still mass cell stabilizers. Let's see if I can say that. I'll get that all at once. So we have the chromalin and nitochromel. Um, just note on here to to that I put them both here because they are both mass cell cell stabilizers. But the nitochromel is only available in eye drops, so it only has an eye drop formulation. So you might want to notice note that it's only for ophthalmic use. Um, so it's it's. This, these slides have some kind of mixed uses, or rather they talk about some different things. I try to label them appropriately, but just, I think early on it's good if you just, so basically the uh, the the second one here is only for allergic conjunctivitis. So note that the chromalin um, does come in a few different preparations. So they have they have an oral inhalation, they have an inhalation project, product, they have a nasal product, they have an eye drop as well. So you can't see me this used for, for um for eye purposes as well and then they also make a po version as well they make an oral concentrate um, that can be prescribed as well so a few different products there um and then students always want to know do i need to memorize that you know do you need to know this for the test um yeah i think it would be that this isn't actually an instance where it would be good because i don't want you then to prescribe or rather pick this as an answer choice and it only comes in eye drops and you're trying to help someone with an inhaled product so just know that this please note and go ahead and write it on there. It only comes in an eye drop preparation. So it would be an inappropriate choice uh, for testing purposes um, if you picked it and you're trying to give someone an inhaled product, right? Let's Or trying to help them with, with their, um, their breathing disorders. The, uh, the eye drops wouldn't help there. 
Um, pharmacokinetics, just FYI, don't worry about that. You can read through that. Mechanism of action. So this is, I think, nice in that it's in the description. These are mass cell stabilizers. It's a classification. And it's also the mechanism of action. So take on point, they stabilize the mast cells. And what does that do? It helps prevent the release of these things, histamines, leukotrienes, right? And what does that mean? Less inflammation, um, and then hopefully better, you know, increased breathing, etc. cetera. Um, but anyways, yeah. And then this one, just just note, that's just FYI, the, the nidocromil, um, actually, yeah, it has a, not that desirable effect on the airway nerves, but it's not that big a deal because it's only an eye drop. So here's a visualization here of where what's happening when you with the mast cell if it is released and so you can see if you are preventing that then all of the things that you can help prevent. So um, for testing purposes for me, don't stress about memorizing everything. Um, it, I think it, it's, it's relevant and it will come up in pathophysiology. So um, you'll have to check with uh, Dr. Fruki on that one, but. Um, but for for my testing purposes, it's not something that you need to um, to memorize. Just know that it it basically would help, hopefully, help prevent the bronchospasms. Is is why we're prescribing it, and that mechanism action is its mast cell stabilization. So I think a pretty straightforward um, mechanism of action. So uses we have some uses here, and again, please refer to guidelines when I go over that lecture as far as what what order these are used in, or, or rather how how they're used. But um, they can help with asthmatic episodes, which is why we're talking about them. So sometimes for exercise-induced or for um, asthma that's caused by cold weather. Um, they can help with allergic rhinitis and seasonal conjunctivitis. Um, they're typically not first-line agents. So, um, you know, again, they can't be prescribed for those things. I'm not saying that it's not ever used, and you will still see it being used for that because it's but just typically not. And then definitely the eye uses I mentioned, so read through those. Um, and I try to, again, in include the drug names so you can kind of get an idea. The chromalin is not the same as the nidocromil um, as far as their uses and stuff because, again, one only comes in an eye drop where the other one has multiple preparations. Adverse effects, we have some GI adverse effects. The second one here just makes basically means it makes things taste funny. Um, and then a cough, it's just kind of annoying. And then it is something that can be worrisome or problematic for someone who already has a baby, a breathing disorder. Um, so that is something to think about. But um, but usually well tolerated, um, not too much. Um, but like I said, it, and when it's also going to depend too, if it's, if it's an eye drop, you know, you don't have the uh, systemic absorption and so probably not nausea, vomiting, but, um, and then the, the, um, the bad taste of your mouth and stuff that's usually more with inhaled products, or sometimes people will say that it has, or like with the nose product, they'll say that it causes, um, the nose to burn or, or weird sensation in their nose or throat. Um, so yeah, that's something too. Oh, and then the, the other thing to note on the cough is it typically is transient. So it is something that, um, it, can, it is pretty common. It can happen up to 20% of the people that, that are, take crumlin, um, but it typically goes away, um, pretty quickly and kind of self-resolves. But, um, like I said, patients don't usually like it that they're coughing, you know, because of the medication. So, so anyways. All right. So next we have the leukotriene synthesis inhibitors. So we just have one to worry about too. This is xyloton. Um, take home point mechanism of action. It's a classification for testing purposes for me. I want you to know that it's a leuko leukotriene synthesis inhibitor. Um, but yeah, so it basically prevents that leukotriene formation. Um, this can help for asthma. So you will see it's there. Um, I want to make sure you guys put a star here with adverse effects next to the hepatotoxicity. Um, that is something that you do have to be concerned with. So, and it's related to, there's not, a, it's not a box warning, so it's not the, the strictest one we've seen in the past, but it is related to a contraindication. So if a person has active liver disease, um, then you need to, uh, then it's not recommended to, pre to prescribe this and it is contraindicated. So that's one of those things where, um, again, maybe see on, on board questions, et cetera, but, uh, but note that. The other thing to note too, oh, and this is just showing again, the, the, um, where we have the leukotriene synthesis inhibitors. Uh, but also note, note too, and we just have the one there, that these are not the same as a leukotriene receptor inhibitors. So very similar. And the reason I mention that is because students in the past have gotten these confused. So xyloton's the only one here 
in the leukotriene synthesis inhibitors, LSI, right? And then the leukotriene receptor inhibitors, we have these two, the Zarfalucast and the Montelukast, okay? So again, testing purposes, I always want you guys to make sure you get your categories straight, et cetera, but, um, but also too, I mean, just please note, so note here that these are different, different drugs. Um, unfortunately, like I said, some since in the past have combined them all together and been like, oh, they all, have, have, they all uh, work on leukotriene, so they're all the same. Um, correct that they all involve leukotriene, but um, they are slightly different. And I definitely want you guys to keep those separate. Um, pretty straightforward again with mechanism of action. These are leukotriene receptor antagonists. So these are leukotriene receptor blockers is another way to say them, but they in inhibit the binding of the leukotrienes. Um, and then that helps with inflammation and helps with breathing, et cetera. So because of that, they are used for asthma. They can help be prof you know, prophylactically or not. Um, they can be used too for allergies, um, allergic rhinitis. You see this a lot in the pediatrics. Uh, on your pediatric rotations, you'll probably see these prescribed a lot for um, um, allergies or allergy problems, the multilucast. They can help prevent exercise-induced bronchospasms, but it's not for acute bronchospasms. So again, these cannot be used for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for um, as a rescue preparation, so or rescue inhaler. Um, so, so note that um, they can be good, again, for pediatrics. Part of the reason, too, is because they do make some non-inhaled preparations of Montelukast. So if a child has problems with the inhaler um, or inhaled preparations, um, that can be used. And then aspirin-induced asthma, too. Adverse effects here. Um, headache is one that it can be common or people complain about. Um, also, maybe some dizziness, too. Is, is kind of related to the CNS side adverse effects, um, GI adverse effects. So we have the gastritis too, but um, diarrhea, nausea, um, abdominal pain too um, are some things that uh, people, you may hear patients complaining about or, or may have problems with. Um, respiratory adverse reactions, again, um, annoying or pe people don't like it, especially if they already have breathing problems, but um, they can have a cough, acute bronchitis, um, laryngitis, um, and these respiratory so like flu-like symptoms, so people don't don't feel well, or it can actually kind of make it, it seems, it's sort of paradoxical in the sense that because it can sometimes make it seem like it's not working because of the the potential for these respiratory adverse effects, that it's actually maybe making um, making the disease process worse. So anyways, just, just FYI on that. Um, drug interactions, um, definitely put a star by here. You do need to be concerned about drug interactions with um, these medications. So that is something to to note. All right, and then we have one monoclonal antibody to worry about today. It's the malizumab. I have to little think about when I'm saying that. The brand name is Zolair, which is X-O-L-A-I-R. It's usually people just refer to it by Zolair, its brand name. Um, and uh, this is a subcutaneous injection, Q2 to four weeks. Um, depending on what you're trying to trying to treat and the and the person, etc. Um, mechanism of action here. So as the title says, it is a monoclonal antibody. So this it inhibits the IgE binding to high affinity IgE receptor on mast cells and basophils. Um, so then, by decreasing bound IgE, the activation and release of mediators in the allergic response is limited. So you get you know have less of allergic response uh, than you would when you're you're not given this. Um, some uses here, um, you guys can go ahead and read through that, but definitely, I mean, it's used for asthma and then it's also can be used for chronic idiopathic urticaria, uh, which you may see it prescribed for that as well. Um, one thing to note is, okay, it's not on here. There is a box warning for this medication I want you guys to use. Um, so there is a box warning for anaphylaxis. Unfortunately, so it can present as bronchospasms, hypotension, syncope, urticaria, and or angioedema of the throat and tongue. Um, this has been unfortunately noted or recorded that it can happen after administration of this medication. Um, it can happen as early as after the first dose of the administration, but then it can also happen up to one year after beginning the regularly administrated med or treatment. Um, so it's something you have to worry about after the first dose and then potentially up to a year after. Um, so, and then because of this risk, they do recommend that you observe patients closely for an appropriate period of time um, after it's it's administered and that you should be man you should be prepared to manage the anaphylaxis 
um, because it can be life threatening. So it is something that um, you need to, to know about. And then it also you have to recommend or rather you have to um, they recommend that you educate your patients about signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and that they need to go, you know, call 911, go to the hospital, get a get a uh, what is it called? Ambulance. I don't know why I couldn't think of the word. Get an ambulance. It's like that car that goes fast with the lights and the siren ambulance <laughs> to get an ambulance and you know seek medical attention as soon as possible so please note that um, as always please go ahead and look at this chart um, note the clinical applications adverse effects contraindications um, seems like every module I get questions from students about these adverse effects they sometimes match they sometimes don't um, what I would recommend is that just go ahead and make you know combine them so Xyloton, I think it only had hepatotoxicity. That's a bad example. But just, you know, if it had a, if, it, if the Xyloton didn't have hepatotoxicity, you go ahead and, you know, add it there. Um, I kind of, I don't see these as being def different things when I look at this, but, um, but anyways, and so, yeah, same thing with contraindications as well. Make sure that, you know, you're looking at everything here. Bronchodilators. So here we have the three classes of medication that can cause bronchodilation, or basically they open up the airways to help increase or in, yeah encourage breathing increase breathing first we have the beta 2 adrenergic receptor agonists so these is where under this we'll find the sabas and the labas so if you i don't know if you want to note that too but there's the short acting beta 2 adrenergic receptor agonist and then the long acting beta 2 adrenergic agonist um so and we'll, we'll have those noted here in a little bit and it is important to know the difference so please note the difference between the short acting and the long acting um, when those are noted. Kinetics. So uh, the kinetics aren't too important other than these are in inhaled or nebulized forms. Um, so, and this basically gives its best effect on the airways, the smooth muscle in the airways. Um, but then they also make a PO, they make some oral medications, some PO ones too, like terbidoline is one, for example. Um, dur duration of action, also important to note that they are rapid acting so these are ones that can be used as rescue forms so especially the short acting the sabas short acting beta agonist are great for a rescue inhaler so like we talked about earlier the corticosteroids are for maintenance these can be used that's just short acting um, beta agonist can be used for rescue inhaler rescue in inhalation and then we also have the labas long acting ones so um, please note those the flut fluticasone you'll notice is a steroid so they do make combination products too um, but then they have the long acting these are the maintenance agents mechanism of action here so they basically they are instead of being beta blockers like we talked about these are beta stimulators so they stimulate the beta-2 receptors because they're agonists, right? And then they help relax the, stricted, the constricted bronchosmooth muscles, which causes bronchodilation. So take on point is that they are beta-2 stimulators, you know, the beta-2 receptor stimulators, and that they cause bronchodilation. Um, and here we go. Here is where they're acting. You guys can see that, but basically it leads to bronchodilation. Oh, but also too for testing purposes. Don't stress to hear about um, necessarily memorizing this all in this this way. Just mechanism of action. Definitely want you guys to know about them. So they can be used for acute asthma attacks, which is good, um, and used for asthmatic patients and patients with COPD. Um, they can be used prophylactically, so that is something that you will see where they'll have. Um, then prescribed for that. Emergency treatment, they do come into, into play there, and we will see that in that there's another slide on that, so don't um, stress too much about the details of that. We'll go over that in a little bit. And then they also have some OB-GYN. We'll see, we'll see the terbidoline used in OB-GYN because it's a tocolytic, um, so it can help delay premature labor. Adverse effects, um, the tremor is something that patients complain about that they don't like, but it's like the shakiness, jitterness, um, I'd encourage you guys, I think they have videos and stuff online. You guys could check that out if you wanted to. Um, you can have systemic adverse effects. So typically, you don't have to worry too much about adverse effects um, with the inhaled product. Um, but if you have overdose or if there's a, a big exposure, you can have more a reason with, I mean, more um, risk of adverse effects, systemic adverse effects. And so I'd, I'd read through all of those, but the anxiety, 
um, you know, this hyperglycemia, which can be a problem if a person has diabetes, um, some electrolyte dis abnormalities and everything. But so definitely read through those and make sure you are familiar with the adverse effects listed here. So we have the long-acting agents, and again, please note, and I want you guys to know the difference between the LABAs, long-acting, and the short-acting, because these, sh the long-acting should not be prescribed and not be used for those acute asthma attacks. Um, so that is something to, to note. So SABAs and LABAs are not created equally, and um, important to make sure you know the difference there. Box warning too, you also be concerned with. So unfortunately, there is a box warning for asthma-related death. Um, it's because these LABAs, the long-acting beta-2 agonists, um, unfortunately can increase the risk of asthma-related death. They're currently looking into seeing if, if you give these with other medications. So if you give these at the same time with inhaled corticosteroids um, or other long-term asthma control drugs, that if they could mitigate these effects. But unfortunately, the data is not clear and hasn't been can kind of finished in the sense that they still don't know if that's adequate or not. Um, so that's because you will sometimes hear that as a strategy or, or sometimes people may propose, pr propose that. So the implications are because of the risk, the use of salbuterol, for example, or the use of these long acting uh, beta agonists for the treatment of asthma without a concomitant long-term asthma control medication, such as an inhaled corticosteroid is contraindicated. Um, so again, they, if you're not prescribing these with something else like an inhaled corticosteroid, it is contraindicated, so it should not be prescribed by itself. Um, it also should only be used as an additional therapy for patients with asthma who are currently taking but are inadequately controlled with a long-term asthma control medication such as an inhaled corticosteroid. So it should be something that, you know, they're on the inhaled corticosteroid and it's not successful by itself. And so there you have to, it's, it's just part of the step up treatment that you would add maybe this long acting um, beta agonist. Um, but then once the asthma control is achieved and maintained, um, that you do need to assess the patient at regular intervals and that you should step down your therapy again and this will be part of the step therapy so a step down then would be to discontinue the LABA um, and then this is if if possible without the loss of asthma control and maintain the patient on a long-term asthma control medication such as an inhaled corticosteroid so basically you know the, the, the guidelines recommend that you you know they're on an inhaled corticosteroid it's not adequate you step up by adding the LABA but then you um they want you to reassess frequently, or regular intervals rather is what they say, and then step down by discontinuing the salmeterol and then keeping them on the inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and they also recommend that you do not use salmeterol for patients whose asthma is adequately controlled on low or medium dose inhaled corticosteroids. So the, the point of that last recommendation is just basically, you know, if they're doing fine with inhaled corticosteroids, don't add this because of the increased risk of asthma related death with these medications. And it's more pronounced. Unfortunately, there is a genetic component. It is more pronounced um, with African American patients. So um, with that could be another reason too, to not start, um, start them on a LABA. The other, the other box warning that they're for these medications are they have a, a warning for pediatric and adolescent patients. Um, so because of all available data, they, they, um, it suggested that these LABAs increase risk of asthma-related hospitalization in pediatric and adolescent patients as well. So just as a recap, two adverse, of, I'm sorry, two box warnings here: asthma-related deaths. Um, just for you know adults, general population, and then there's a second box warning for pediatric and adolescent patients, um, and that those can increase the risk of asthma-related hospitalizations. Then we have the levalbuterol, which is you guys remember from organic chemistry, it's an R isomer, um, but this is does not have those box warnings, or whatever. It's it's supposed to have fewer CNS adverse effects and cardiac adverse effects, so um, can be beneficial there. Uh, but let's see. And this can be used uh, for bronchospasms. Most common adverse effects are headache, um, vomiting. Um, and unfortunately, too, can increase the risk of viral infections is another one. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that one you also will see. That's the generic for Zopinex. It's a brand name for that one. 
Epinephrine we'll see with the um, emergency slides or the emergency presentation. So um, you'll refer back to that, but just know that that can help in an emergency setting. Um, the methylxanthines, so historically these were used more and these were kind of the go-to treatment, but nowadays, and you'll see why these aren't, um, these have a lot of issues with them and stuff, so they're not prescribed often. You still see them every once in a while, but um, but not, not prescribed frequently. Kinetics, um, so this is part of the reason they're not prescribed a lot. So put a star here, drug interactions. You have to be concerned about drug interactions. I'm going to let you guys read through those. Um, lots of drug interactions with these medications. So, and kind of the, the, the textbook sort of stereotypical board question is someone's on the theophylline for whatever reason, and then there's some drug interaction implication you have to think about. The other thing, too, that um, isn't great about these drugs or can be problematic is that they have a narrow therapeutic index, the NTI, narrow therapeutic index. And this basically just means that there's a narrow window in what you can prescribe these drugs. And so if you go above you know, a certain dose for a person, you have toxicity. Um, and then if you go below that little, that's short window, you don't, it's sub therapeutic. So it doesn't, it's not effective as far as helping with bronchospasms. Um, so you, this is one that you do will have to measure, you know, and look at the, um, lab values and stuff. And there's a therapeutic range here that there's there that, uh, make sure you guys look at. Um, but yeah, so narrow therapeutic index take on point, put a star by that makes it problematic for dosing because it's it basically means it's a lot easier to get into to toxicities or it's easier to be subtherapeutic and it's not effective and it's not helping the patient with their breathing problems. So mechanism actually you guys can read through this. They basically they cause a bronchodilation, um, typically through phosphodiesterase inhi inhibition, which then increases the CAMP and then causes relaxation of bronchial smooth muscles. Um, so again, take home point, they are bronchodilators. And you can see where they're working here. It's the Offlin's example that's given there. Um, adjunctive treatment, definitely not first line. Um, so like I said, you see them sometimes, they can be used for asthma or COPD, but um, they do have to be used in caution with people with a lot of these different disorder. So I mentioned the drug interactions, the therapeutic index, and then there's also diseases that you have to be concerned with. So it's not recommended to be used in patients with these diseases. And on top of that too, that you have to use it in comp in cautious caution, excuse me, with patients who also have hyperthyroidism. That one's not on here. So um, heart disease. So uh, specifically to um, acute MI, um, a person has hypertension, heart failure, um, stat, uh, seizure disorders, um, it unfortunately can, can make that worse. Um, there's also, you have to be cautious if the person has renal impairment, which is also not listed on here. Um, so a lot of different issues, a lot of disease you have to be concerned with, uh, when prescribing these. These are pretty, overall, pretty medi messy medications. And I think that's a big reason why they're not used as much as they were. Historically, they were used because they didn't, there weren't other things to use for bronchodilation. And so that you, you used to see them prescribed a lot more. Adverse effects, so another reason, too, that they're not used a lot, but definitely read through those. But um, And you can see that these could have negative impacts on other disease states, um, right? So now we have the anticholinergic agents, which are also known as muscarinic receptor antagonists. So for better or for worse, those are interchangeable, and you will see on the exam, pur for exam purposes and on your board exams, you will see those both being used. Um, sometimes interchangeably, I'm, I'm sorry, always interchangeably, but sometimes they'll use muscarinic receptor antagonists, and sometimes they'll say it's an old anticholinergic agent. So um, I have them both listed there, so please make sure you know both um, for my testing purposes, but also for your boards. Um, and we have a couple there, the ipatropium and the teotropium. Um, they basically blockade the effects of the vagus nerve stimulation because they are anticholinergic or they um, mechanism of action another way you could put it is that they are muscarinic receptor antagonists so they're blocking the muscarinic receptors um, involved in the nerve stimulation so they help prevent bronchoconstriction they're typically given um, in combination with the uh, the beta agonist um, so for asthma and COPD So you guys can just read through the rest of that. 
So here we have adverse effects. Uh, definitely put a star by here. It is something you have to be concerned about. You're going to see these anticholinergic medications coming up in a, in a few different modules, and you'll have to know what the anticholinergic effects are. So um, let me jump to something real quick. So here I have um, some people like these for studying purposes. I know my wife used to like these, but uh, just Google anticholinergic effects, image search. Um, and people have made these different um, visualizations, mnemonics, et cetera. Uh, here's one here. May cause you to be hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet, mad as a hatter. Um, so that may help. But definitely look at these um, common anticholinergic symptoms. But yeah, I like some of these visual ones. There's some people like these. Oh, you notice the first generation antihistamines we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But anticholinergic effects, um, if you look at the study guides, you can find um, things like that that may help you um, remember those. And let's just see if I can just jump back over to these. Yeah, so we have the dry mouth, GI upset, urinary retention, increased oxygen pressure, which can be problematic for glaucomas. Um, but definitely, yeah, make sure you look at those, put a star by that. And also to try to think about the implications. Like I mentioned, if a person has glaucoma, what does that mean? If a person is, is has any kind of urinary retention issues, what can that mean? Um, these are more pronounced and can be worse in an elderly population. So um, that's also something to think about these anticholinergic effects, and then it, the age of the patient that's in the vin vignette or in, in your case uh, case presentation or in, in the, um, the case question on an exam. Good summary table here. Definitely go ahead and look at this and make sure you study this as well. Antihistamines. So here we have, you'll notice there's a first generation and a second generation. Uh, basically, what that means, the first generation are the older medications. They came out first, and then the second generation, the new, improved. Um, definitely want you guys to know for testing purposes and for your boards and for life as a PA, um, you will need to know which ones are first generation and which ones are second generation. So please, please, please note that. Um, make sure you know the difference. And make sure you're able to make generalizations about first generation and second generation. So uh, one big one that comes off that when you compare first generation to second generation, sedation is usually more of an issue with the first generation than they are with the second generation because the first generation will cross the blood-brain barrier and you have more instance of sedation. You can still have sedation with the second generation, but again, it's comparison. Compared to first generation, second gener gen generation has less sedation. So that's an example of something that I'd want you guys to make a generalization about the class, the second generation, and be able to you know apply that for testing purposes. First, we have the H1 blockers, histamine antagonists, histamine blockers. Um, and there's H1 and H2 blockers, but we're just gonna be talking about the H1 here. I just wanted to make sure and look, double check my list. We will be talking about the H2 blockers in the GI module, so stay tuned for that. We will get back on that. Um, kinetics here, not too important other than what I mentioned about crossing the blood-brain barrier. So first generation sedation, put a star by that, highlight that, want to make sure you know that. Second generation has less sedation, still has some sedation and you will have patients complain about it. You will hear about sedation, etc. with second generation, but again, compared to the first generation. Um, these dynamics I normally don't make you guys look at, but please look at this, and this is going to be important here. Um, you'll notice that the H1 blocking does help with edema itching, and like I said too, it doesn't have an effect on the H2 receptors, which we will talk about. Um, those are used for GERD or acid reflux. Those we'll see in the GI. Um, so only H1 receptors we're talking about now, um, and that also too is important to notice that the first generation block the muscarinic and alpha adrenergic receptors, which then therefore has implications for their adverse effects, but then also has implications of their uses. So they can be used for some different things than the second generation because of that. And then also note too that ciproheptidine, ciproheptidine, ciproheptidine is unique in that it also blocks serotonin receptors. So you, again, related to its use and where you sometimes will see it being used. Um, and it's a little bit special when it goes to the goes to comes to the first generation. Adverse effects. So touched upon this a few times already, but CNS adverse effects, definitely with first generation. So sedation is a big issue with those. And that can be more pronounced and or more of a concern in a pediatric population or in a geriatric population, right? So um, need to be thinking about that. Um, 
and they can be um, problematic when overdosed and they can cause seizures with that. Other than that, it, GI adverse effects um, can be an issue, but they're usually well tolerated. Um, and then atropine-like effects, which is also known as anticholinergic effects. So atropine-like, aka anticholinergic effects with the first generation. Why? Because they block muscarinic receptors, which we just talked about those anticholinergic medications. So you can use that same studying guide as far as the mad as a hatter, dry as a hair, or hot as a hair. I don't remember what it is. Okay, but so go back to the video. Um, those things always confuse me and I don't use them for studying purposes. But like I said, my wife loved them and she'd use them all the time. And I know some students like them. So I, I share them with you guys just because they may help some of you all. But Atropine-like, aka anticholinergic. And atropine is a medication we're going to talk about later in another module, so stay tuned for that. Uses, lots of uses here. Um, definitely pay attention to these. So the uses are important here because of the, um, you see them in a lot of different, you know, inpatient use, outpatient use, a lot of different settings, um, pediatric, psychiatric. Um, so definitely I want you guys to look at these. There's some over-the-counter ones. Um, so go ahead and read through these. Make sure you, you know uh, where they fit and fall um, and where they're at. Um, you'll note too here that promethazine is on here. A lot of times students will forget that it's, or not think of it as an antihistamine, but it is first generation antihistamine. Um, and part of it, I think, is because of its use. It is very effective at helping with nausea and vomiting. Um, but anyways, and then too, it's, it's also part of the popular promethazine with codeine, um, that purple stuff <laughs> or drink or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's a, a popular street drug that's a, that's abused. Um, that um, And part of that is because promethazine has CNS adverse effects. So people have that, it's a desired kind of drunk feeling or whatever um, in combination with the codeine. Um, but so that's where you may see it in popular culture or whatever, or familiar with it there. Um, RIP DJ Screw, no, I'm kidding, anyone from Houston? But yeah, unfortunately DJ Screw died from a promethazine and codeine overdose. Um, so that's unfortunate there. And it's, an, so don't recommend you guys trying or using it without a prescription or without, um, if you get it off the street or whatever. Anyway, so yeah, read through all those and make sure you pay attention to all of these. Precautions here. So this first one, machine operation. So definitely because of the adverse effects of the CNS adverse effects, the first generation should be. So what does that mean? There's all, well, not always, but it seems like there's, it'll be the board style question will be like, there is a warehouse worker who is operating a forklift or a forklift operator, or there's um, a, some kind of farmer who's on some big tractor or 18 wheeler driver or whatever. So those are key kind of clue word, you know, key words, clues in your questions that you'll see. Um, that, and I think I had one on my board questions and I think it was a, I think it was a farm worker who did some like, grain operation or something but it was again implications were adverse effects they aren't recommended because of that so anyway so note that make sure you um pay attention to that um and then there's also it's a cumulative effect so it can be synergistic in the sense that um with the first generations you need to be mindful of other medications that can cause cns depression so i mentioned the promethazine with codeine again there's that there's accumulation of the effect so codeine can cause drowsiness promethazine can cause drow drowsiness so in combination it can be more pronounced. So it's definitely something you have to war warn about um, with your patients. Um, that That is something that um, can be more pronounced. Other thing to note too is the FDA has issued a public health advisory. Um, this is specifically for OTC, over-the-counter um, cough and cold medications that contain antihistamines. So they should not be used under two years of age. Um, so please note that. So that doesn't mean that it can never be prescribed. You won't see an inpatient or pediatric pediatricians aren't doing it, but it's specifically for over the counter. So for your patients who have young children, um, just advise them to not take these medications over the counter without coming to see you first or um, to, um, you know, not with without medical supervision is what they say, right? So, so note that. Um, another thing too that's kind of related to um, people doing things that they probably shouldn't be, no, but over the counter, <laughs> so to speak, they do sell alcohol over the counter, right? And so um, these first generation sh antihistamines should not be mixed with alcohol, um, especially again with operating hyper, hyper heavy machinery or with driving or whatever, um, because again, because the CNS depression. So that's important too, the to note. Um, and something to advise your patients about. So I remember there was one patient that was joking about how 
um, their sleep aid was that they would um, take a Benadryl, which is diphenhydramine. Benadryl is diphenhydramine, which is first generation um, antihistamine, and then um, drink a beer, and they would pass out. So it's like, well, that's definitely not that's not good medical advice. I advised, I didn't, I probably smiled, but I didn't laugh, and I was very professional. I said that's not <laughs> a good idea. Definitely don't. Um, that's not something that's in as a healthcare practitioner, you shouldn't encourage or anything. Um, and I told them that, you know, you need me to talk to your doc- doctor about sleep hygiene and maybe doing something else about your sleep or issues or whatever. And it's not a good idea to mix uh, first generation antihistamines with alcohol. Um, and that's the other th- issue too, where people get in trouble with the promethazine with codeine is they'll drink it with alcohol as well. So promethazine, first generation sedation, codeine, sen- codeine has sedation and then alcohol has sedation. So get into trouble there um, with those. Um, a second generation one that wasn't in the book, so I added it here, it's Zizol, levocetirazine. Um, this one is, uh, again, it's an H1 blocker, so you guys can read through that. Um, it's used for typically for allergies, so allergic rhinitis. Se- seizure, aller- it can also be used for idiopathic uticaria, um, so that can be something that you'll see it prescribed for. Um, I sometimes see specialists that will use this one um, for really bad uticaria. Um, adverse re- reactions, typically it's just GI. Um, you'll notice there is still some drowsiness here. So of the second generation ones, the Zizol can be, have a little bit more drowsiness than some of the other ones like, and Zizol is levocetirazine. Then the cetirazine, which is um, which is Zyrtec, which is um, also on the counter. The levocetirazine is supposed to be um, a more potent f- form of the cetirazine, which is the, the Zyrtec. Um, it's another second generation antihistamine. Um, but anyways, but yeah, so it's a little bit different, a little bit different adverse effects here. You guys can read through those, but you'll notice they're, they're not as common as the GI upset. Um, the contraindication you notice here, um, the end stage renal disease is one that's interesting. And then infants and children's, uh, who also have renal impairment. So there's some implications there. Um, the CNS depression, again, it's a second generation. So compared to first generations, it is um, less sedation, but then of the second generations, this one, the levocetirazine d- does have an issue with CNS depression, and this is more so than some of the other second generation ones like fexofenadine, which is um, Allegra, it's a generic Allegra. Anyway, so here is the list here. Um, please look at those. Um, note and please look at which ones are first generation and which ones are second generation. And then please note their uses too. So sometimes the first generations are better with things like motion sickness, right? So you'll notice that motion sickness is something that you could use the first generation for like meclizine, um, but then it's not there with the second generation. Um, adverse effects are, again, need to know the differences, first generation versus second generation. You'll notice the sedation is usually more pronounced with the exception of the levocetirazine. You still have to be concerned with it. Um, also to note, I have had patients that they'll, they take cetirazine and they say it makes them drowsy and puts them to sleep. What I'll, I'll say to that is, you know, second generation, they shouldn't have problems with sedation, but everybody's unique. So if a patient comes to me in the pharmacy complaining about that, I just say, hey, don't take it in the morning or don't take it before we have to drive or operate heavy machinery if they're a forklift operator or something. Um, and that, you know, but but for testing purposes for me, I want you guys to make these generalization adverse effects, sedation, anticholinergic adverse effects. I want you to think first generation, right? Um, and then versus second generation. Um, and then please note the contraindications as well here with first and second generation. And that is it for me. Thank you guys for your time and attention. I always appreciate that. Even though you can't see me, I am smiling and I'm thanking you. <laughs> Thank you all. So um, that's it for me. I expect there's going to be a couple, there's going to be one more asthma presentation and then um, there'll be some other presentations this module. And as always, feel free to email me if you have any questions or reach out to me. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.